That's why. Now, I believe that people still understand the purpose of God. People still misunderstand what Jesus is doing in their lives. We all see that all around us. Some people think that Jesus came to get us to turn over a new leaf. They think that Jesus came to make us moral. But Jesus did not come to make you moral. Now, should you be moral? Yes. And when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, will you be better? Will you obey? Yes. But his purpose was to bring dead things to life. And that's what Jesus has as his purpose today. And in the future, and I know we have these little remnants of what we feel that we should have and what should be right, what should be righteous, what should be holy, because we all have this all the time, right? I mean, we long for the day when there's no more sorrow. We had someone today talk about how that they had lost a, a relative to death. We long for the day when there is no more pain. I, I talk to people every Sunday that are in pain. As we age, we all tend to have more pain, do we not? I mean, the fact is, my body has changed. When I was in my 20s, it seems like I could go forever. I could skip an entire night's sleep, and it was no problem. I would work all day the next day, never skip a beat. Now it seems like I need a nap after lunch, all right? Um, or your body changes. You know, there used to be a time when I was, you know, felt like at least I was in shape. Now, after I get out of the shower and I bend over to get deodorant to put on, a pint of water pours out of my belly button, you know, I, that I did not know was there. <laughs> but things change. Look, the purpose. We all have this, uh, these reflections, if you will, these little echoes of what is right. We long for justice. That's why when someone abuses a child, when someone abuses their spouse, when someone steals something for someone, we have in our heart, we know that is not right. We long for a day that there will be justice. And there will be one day. There will be when Jesus himself rules and reigns. When King Jesus is the leader, then there will be justice. But in the meantime, understand that his purpose, yes, eventually, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sin, no more injustice. But in the meantime, you know, I heard a guy say it this way one time. A lot of times as saints of God, we long for the sweet by and by. But in the meantime, we must live in the nasty now and now. And so understand that God has a purpose. Don't misunderstand it. Some people accept his purpose. Look at Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. We beg you, O Lord, save us. We beg you, O Lord, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the Lord's house. And they were quoting this psalm when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. But I want you to notice the last sentence in that verse 26. We bless you from the Lord's house. Now, obviously, they at that time were referring to the temple, but the temple is the house of God. And I really do believe that blessing begins at the house of God. Blessing begins in your relationship with God. I've said it this way often. Success begins on Sunday in your worship of God. But when we understand his purpose, I want you to read Psalm 1 with me, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You want steadiness and peace in your life? You want the feeling that uh, there's not chaos, but there's joy? You see, for many of us, we don't realize that apart from a relationship with God, there is nothing but chaos. You see, when you are not a follower of Jesus, when you not, are not a believer, what happens in your life? It's utter chaos. 
oh, as believers, we still have problems. Listen, but we'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You want to be able to have roots in your life so that when the storm comes, you're not going to blow over. A little over a year ago, a tornado hit near our house, and there were big, giant oak trees that were probably over 150 years old. They were just completely blown over. The root balls were higher than my head. Do you know that even a big old oak like that can be blown over? But when you have the roots that God gives you, when you meditate on the Word of God, when you follow His purpose for your life, what happens? You'll be like a tree planted by the waters, and you will not fail in the storm. We all have storms. We all have trials. But he said that you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and that you will bring forth fruit in the right season. How many of you know that there's a time for planting and there's a time for harvesting? That there's a time that we sow and we prepare and we work the soil, but thank God for the time of harvest. And what is the purpose of harvest? It is to supply your need. It is to create bread for your household. And that's what Jesus does. Don't misunderstand his purpose. He'll be like a tree that brings forth his fruit in his season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And I love this little last phrase. And whatsoever he does will prosper. You want true prosperity. Look, we all get this worldly sense of what prosperity is. We think, boy, if I can have a full bank account or if I can have a beautiful house or if I can have a vacation in this uh, luxurious place or if I can drive the newest, nicest car on the block. We have this idea of success. And and yes, it is a, a part of being financially successful, being able to manage your money and not be in debt. Yeah, I get all that. But biblically, success is different than what the world sees. You see, you can spend your life climbing the ladder of success and then at the end find out that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall all the time. That's not what those that fulfill his purpose, they meditate on the word of God. They they let it get into them. They become like a tree planted by rivers of water. They bring forth fruit. When the storm comes, when the drought comes, they do not fail because in whatever they do, they prosper. We need to learn to accept his purpose, why he came. And by the way, sometimes his purpose is contrary to our purpose. You know, you and I can have a purpose that does not match God's purpose, right? But God, when we follow him and when we accept his purpose, what happens? He gives us success. But then there are those that reject the purpose of God. Listen to the last three verses of Psalm 1. The ungodly are not so. He described the successful man or woman, the one that has deep roots and Uh, survives trials and storms, the one that prospers in all that they do. He says, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. That, do do you get the idea of, he said, blessing comes, begins at the house of the Lord. He talks about the congregation of the righteous, that family of God. That's where your success begins. He says sinners won't stand. In other words, they're not going to last. They're going to make it through in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish, shall perish. So you have to understand that Jesus came because of a great purpose. And he entered into the city Because he had a great purpose. And so we can rejoice with his purpose. He came, why? Uh, We can rejoice because of his passion. Why did Jesus come? Here's a question that maybe you can reflect on and and wrestle with. If Jesus knew what 
lay ahead for him, and he did. If he knew the suffering that was going to come. And by the way, what Jesus groaned for and over when he said not, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. It was not the physical suffering. Oh, he knew what the physical suffering was, but many before him and many after him had been crucified or suffered a brutal death. So it was not the physical suffering, but it was the fact that he was going to drink the cup of sin. And I, I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said in a sermon, the famous preacher from the 1800s in, in London. And he talked about the cup of Jesus. When he went to the cross for us, and I quote, he says, and he took it, talking about the cup, he took it, and with one great draft of love, he drank damnation dry. Oh, I love that. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. Why? He came because of his passion. His passion for you, his passion for me. He came to die for our sin. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if you have ever sinned, that qualifies you as to why Jesus came. Now, if you've never sinned, well, I got bad news for you. You still are a sinner because you're a liar, <laughs> okay? <laughs> or you're just filled with pride, which is also a sin. But Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I've talked to many people in my life that felt like they'd gone too far. I've heard people say things like this. Boy, if I ever walked into that church, the roof would cave in, you know? But I always say to people like that, so would you say you're a sinner? Oh, yeah, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I, I've done things I'm ashamed of. I said, well, you know what? The Bible tells us that Jesus came for people just like you. You've not gone too far. God will Fulfill his purpose and save you if you'll simply turn to him. He came to deliver us from our sentence, not just our sin. Uh, listen to John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus has a purpose. He wants to deliver you from the sentence of sin. You see, the sentence is separation from God. I believe that Scripture teaches that hell is a literal, real place. That when people reject Jesus, for all of eternity, they're separated from God. And that's what makes it hell. That's what makes it unbearable. The separating from Jesus, think about this. In that place, in where there is no Holy Spirit, where there is no uh, God the Son, where there is no God the Father, there also is no love. There's no joy. There's no peace. Can you imagine an eternal existence like that? Well, I don't know if there's literal fire. I tend to believe that that fire is a metaphor. I tend to believe because fire in the Bible represents the judgment of God. I believe that whether the fire there is a literal physical fire, I believe the worst fire is the fire that is in our conscience when we realize that we rejected God and we did not want him in our life. And now for all of eternity, Never will you experience love, only hate. Never will you experience joy, only pain and sorrow. Never will you experience any kind of peace, only chaos. Can you imagine an existence like that? Eternally separated from God. Well, you don't have to go there. And you don't have to experience this because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That gives the idea that you can come to the Father. And that is indeed good news. He came to delight us with his salvation. Psalm 35, 9. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight 
in his salvation. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time that you took time to delight in your salvation? Oh, we can get distracted by a lot of things, right? Our pain, our problems, our complaining. We can complain about so many things, right? But you know what? We have reason to delight. We have reason to rejoice. And yeah, you may be having a bad day and maybe a bad week and maybe even a bad year. It happens. But there is no reason for you to be despondent. Why? Because he said you can delight in his salvation. No matter what the pain that you go through, no matter the prospects, be they dim for your future, you and I can rejoice because we can delight in his salvation. I find it interesting that there are two ways of describing salvation in Scripture. Often, David and other writers would describe salvation as theirs, as in possessive, that they got it. It was not what they created, but they received it. But often in Scripture, the Bible talks about his salvation. Why is that important? Because it does not come from you. It does not come from me. It does not come from how clever I am. It does not come from how powerful or talented I am. It does not come from how rich I am. It comes from God alone. And so we can rejoice in his salvation. And then finally, the final thought is we rejoice with our praise. We're talking about how that we can rejoice in his purpose. That's what Jesus came to do. He, he entered the city to do this. We can rejoice because of his passion. He had the passion that even though, even though he knew that he was going to suffer greatly, his passion, the Bible tells us that because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Now, how can anyone say that they look forward with joy to the suffering that Jesus awaited. How can that be? Oh, it was not that he saw just the suffering. He saw beyond it. He saw that we would be reunited with him and with the Father forever. And that we would fulfill the very purpose for which he created mankind. To be in relationship with God. So we rejoice over that by praising him. We praise him for the blessing of salvation. Mark 11, 9 and 10, Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people were all around him shouting, praise God, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest. We can rejoice because of salvation. And today, if you do not have his salvation, if you have not received him, you can today. That's good news. You see, Jesus died for you. He, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, pulls you, directs you into himself. He convicts you. He draws you to himself. And all you got to do is say yes. Yes to the Father. Believe that God, and by the way, the cool thing about this is not only does he provide the salvation, he also provides the faith. You see, it's not according to how strong your faith is. I used to struggle with this as a young man, uh, mainly because I saw some scary movies when I was about 10 years old. And every night before I went to bed, I would say, Lord, just in case, I want to be saved tonight, all right? And I probably did that at least 100 times, not realizing that I didn't have to do that. Why? Because it's not that I, I see, I doubted that I had enough faith. I was like, well, maybe I wasn't holding my mouth right. Or maybe I didn't ask in the right way. Or, or maybe I was just in a bad mood. No. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word call, it's literally asking. Calling indicates faith. That when you ask, you say, you know what? God, I don't have this together. I don't have my act together. I've got sin. I need forgiveness. And Lord, I'm trusting you and you alone. Not You don't come to God saying, Lord, look at my resume. 
I never have, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run with girls that do. <laughs> I got me a good resume. You know what the Bible says, and, and, and I'm not trying to be gross uh, or inappropriate. In the Old Testament, it says that our sins are as filthy rags. And we read that in English and like, oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know in the Hebrew language what that means? It means that our sins are as gross and disgusting and repulsive to God. The word filthy rags, it means menstrual rags. Now, can you imagine that to God, that your best resume, I am so good. I've done so many good things. I've helped so many old ladies. I've given a portion of my income. I'm generous. And God looks at that. When you're depending on that to get right with God, he says, why would you bring me used menstrual rags? I mean, literally, and I realize that's a bit descriptive. And maybe for some of you, it might be too much. But that's actually what the Bible says. And so do you get the idea that God does not, he's not wanting your righteousness because he said it's worthless. What he wants is the righteousness of his son, which all you've got to do to get that, you don't keep the Ten Commandments. You don't earn it by being a good little boy or a good little girl. But rather, you ask. You trust him. You say, I need you, and you can rejoice because of that. We praise him for the benefits of salvation, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on, the, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Aren't you glad that Jesus came to us and he's still with us? Aren't you glad that he is righteous, holy, and brings salvation and aren't you glad that he humbled himself for us? I couldn't do it. We praise him for the beauty of salvation, Revelation 7, 9 to 11. And after this, I look and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's talking about Jesus. Clothed in white robes, that's what's going to happen, your Filthy garments of sin will be replaced by the beautiful robe of righteousness from Jesus. So he looks around. You know what he saw? Saved people. Forgiven people. Redeemed people. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Get the idea that he's going to complete what he started. They, they wanted to use the palm branches in their hands when he first went into the city uh, there at the triumphant entry. But he's like, hold on. Hold on, there'll be a time for that. It's coming. But he says, there they are with palm branches in their hands and they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, I know that salvation belongs to him. I know it now. I'm convinced of it from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But when I see him, when I'm able to watch the Lamb of God and I'm there in the crowd and I'm holding the palm branch, you can bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to shout to the top of my lungs with that horde of people that have been saved. Salvation belongs to God, our God, the one who sits on the throne. It's not me. I will be more convinced at that point than at any point in my life. Oh, thank God. He said, and all the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. By the way, I sometimes get amused by some of these songs that, do I believe that throughout eternity we're going to be able to hug Jesus' neck, shake his hand, touch him? Yes, I do, because he will eternally be God in human form, okay? But if you think that standing before a holy God is a light thing, I hear songs and people talk about, well, when I see him, I'm just going to march right up and I'm going to... I doubt it. When you stand in the awesome presence of the God of the universe, 
the Holy One, I think our response is just going to be like these. We're going to fall on our face. We're going to say, thank you. Thank you for your God. You alone have salvation. And we're going to be so filled with joy and thankfulness that our response is not going to be to high five and to walk up and casually approach Jesus. I think our initial response is going to be to fall on our face, to be so thankful. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Do you say amen to that today? I believe that Jesus came for a purpose and it was to bring us to the Father to repentance, to salvation, to forgiveness. And, and he has accomplished that through his work on the cross. Well, I've already mentioned this week, we have several opportunities for you to be able to reflect. And I hope you will. I hope you will not go throughout this week without thinking. Small groups this week will read Mark 15, and they're going to have communion. Good Friday service uh, at 7 o'clock for anyone that wants to come. We're going to read Mark 15 about the crucifixion of Christ, and we're going to have communion. There's not going to be fancy lights. There's not going to be music. It's just going to be we're going to come in. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 15, and we're going to reflect, and we're going to rejoice. Friday was a day of sorrow. It was the death of the Son of God. It was the day Jesus gave his life. <laughs> but thank God Sunday is coming. And on that Sunday, on that Easter Sunday, we will rejoice. Why? Because Jesus resurrected from the grave. Aren't you glad for that today, church? Yeah. Amen. Well, today, I hope you will turn your problems to him. We're going to end our service today by taking communion to reflect to remember. And I hope you will do that today. Um, we have the elements which represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And um, his body was broken for us. His blood takes our sins away. And today, I hope you will reflect and remember and rejoice for what Jesus has done. Heavenly Father, help us as we come to you today to partake of these elements which represent the blood and the body of Jesus. Help us to remember that you forgive, to remember that salvation belongs to you and you offer it to us freely as a gift. And Lord, we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand for a moment and then if you'd like to come and partake in communion, come down the center aisle and go back to your seat on the sides, but get the elements, go back to your seat and have a seat, and let's just reflect for a few moments on what Jesus has done for us. You may come, let's come down the center and go back on the sides.
see some of you already partaking in prayer. Some of you are waiting, reflecting. And so I want to just remember what Jesus did. This represents his blood, which was shed for us. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. What does that mean? Well, since the penalty of sin is death, the only way for sin to be paid for is through the shedding of blood. The shedding of an blood of an innocent lamb or the lamb of God. So an innocent human died in our place. The son of God shed his blood for us. His body was broken for us. And Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Lord, this week as we remember you, help us never to forget that salvation belongs to the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me encourage you and remind you one more time today, immediately starting just now after the service, if you'd like to find out what it means to be a member, just going to the next step class doesn't require you to join, although we say participation is membership here. It's not about getting your name signed on a sheet of paper, but being a part of the family. So go to this room to my right, to your right on the way out, okay? And we'll be there for a bit, uh, not very long. Uh, Also, don't forget, Wednesday we have our prayer time at noon, and then Friday we have the Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. When I say service, I use that word loosely. We're going to read Mark 15, we're going to take communion, and we're going to reflect, okay? And then, of course, Sunday, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, 9.30 and 11, so don't miss it. Use an opportunity to invite somebody. Go on social media. Use Instagram, use Facebook, use your phone to text others. I like to call it redeeming your social media because there's a lot of it that needs redeeming, right? So, uh, but you can redeem that. So do that this week and we'll see you next Sunday. I love you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. We'll see you next week.